The keys to today's economic news, washing machines, Facebook, and oil. We'll make it all make sense for you from American Public Media. This is Marketplace. In Los Angeles, I'm Kai Rizdahl. Thursday, today, the 28th day of January. Great, as always, to have you with us, everybody. Without putting too fine a point on it, there are more economic indicators out there than you can shake a stick at. So many that, honestly, you can get lost in them. We do try real hard to concentrate on the biggies around here. Jobs, gross domestic product, for instance. The kind of numbers that can give you a top-level view. Every now and then, though, it can be good to drill down a little bit, and today presents just such an opportunity. There was a report out this morning on something called Orders for Durable Goods, big stuff that we're going to use for a while, like appliances, say a washing machine. Durable orders in December were down. They were way down. It is, I'll admit, a just slightly arcane number in this time of interest rate and stock market obsession, but it does have good value. So Marketplace's Sabri Beneshore explains durables and what they might mean for us and for 2016. Walk through your office or your house and you will see plenty of durable goods. There's the refrigerator, your computer, the printer, your HVAC system. Maybe you are driving a durable good right now. Basically items that are intended to last at least three years. Samir Samana is with Wells Fargo Investment Institute. Now, you're not going to put down for a durable good like a new computer, much less a big piece of factory equipment, if you don't think you're going to use it and pay for it and maybe make some money off of it in the next few years, which is why economists care about durable goods orders. It reflects a certain amount of sentiment and confidence regarding the future. And in December, it looks like confidence about the future was pretty poor. Uncertainty is starting to make its way into consumers and into company psyche. That is not to say, though, that this is all about feelings. The dollar has continued to strengthen, making our exports less competitive. So U.S. producers are certainly being hard hit. Sarah Johnson is with IHS Global Insight. One industry that normally orders a lot of durable goods is oil and gas. And with oil prices so low, orders have been low, too. But there is something that durable goods numbers do not capture. What it's not capturing is the stronger parts of the economy, such as the U.S. consumer, which is doing very well right now. Jay Jacobs is director of research at Global X Funds. Unemployment's low. Uh, Wages are increasing. There's more disposable income because oil is cheap. And when it comes down to it, manufacturing is important to our economy, but it's only about 12 percent and falling. Campbell Harvey is professor of finance at Duke. We can't use the same sort of calculus that, oh, well, durable goods are down, therefore we're going into a recession. That might have been true in 1950, but it's not true in 2016. What is true about 2016 is that our economy is extremely conflicted, partly doing well, partly dragging, mix it together, and you just get a lot of economic blah. In New York, I'm Sabri Beneshore for Marketplace. I don't like to tell tales out of school. That's not my style. But there was a great line at our morning meeting today aimed, I think, in my general direction. Facebook is not the economy, it went, and the economy is not Facebook. Touche and... Maybe not, but holy cow, did you see their earnings yesterday? Honestly, they're just killing it. Ad revenue up 52%, way more than Wall Street was expecting, and 80% of that coming from mobile ads. You add it all up, $4.5 billion. Shares, of course, boomed today, but I will pause here to remind you that not all that long ago, like 18 months, maybe two years tops, the social network behemoth of today was struggling mightily to break free from the desktop. So... What happened? Sally Herships has that. Facebook has been playing a long game of catch-up. Sean Patil is an internet analyst with Susquehanna Financial Group. He says back in 2007, when the iPhone launched and the world started going mobile, Facebook got stuck a step behind. During that transition, while a lot of these companies had figured out how to monetize desktop, since mobile was so new, they were still working on figuring it out. Here's one way they did. They really pioneered what's known as native advertising. So placing ads within the kind of normal newsfeed flow of the user. And Facebook made a big decision to create its own app. Spencer Scott is with Fixu. It helps advertisers buy ads on platforms like Facebook. So an app that a consumer could download and abandon their strategy of just being a mobile website. 
Then the company bought Instagram and a few years later WhatsApp, a messaging app. So as younger Facebook users cut back on the site because their mothers are there, they're still logging into the Facebook universe. Sham Patil again. Exactly. They, they may not think they're on Facebook, but they really are. Delivering a steady stream of data. Names, birthdays, all your likes. Ben Schachter is an internet analyst at Macquarie. You can say, I only want to show this ad to a female uh, person who happens to like Star Wars in Missouri. And if advertisers want broad reach, they know. There's Facebook, there's Google, then there's everybody else. In New York, I'm Sally Herships for Marketplace. Facebook shares, ticker symbol, a very unimaginative FB, by the way, up 15.5% today. The rest of Wall Street up as well, more modestly. Of course, we'll have the details when we do the numbers. Today, the Michigan legislature voted to send another $28 million to help Flint through its water crisis. The money is going to help cover more bottled water and filters and more testing and monitoring of lead levels in town. You know, Flint was hardly affluent before this. 40 percent of residents live below the poverty line, and the school system in town has a multi-million dollar hole in its budget. And that really is where this water crisis is going to come home to roost. With the kids who live in Flint in schools where the effects of lead poisoning are going to linger for years. Marketplace's Lizzie O'Leary reports from Flint. Of the skills you'd expect a typical 12-year-old to have, filtering lead is not one of them. You um, push this down to make the filter like come on. But like most kids in Flint, Savannah Liddell is not living a typical existence right now. And when it's up... So which is the which is the good water, which is the bad water? Good and bad are relative in this case, since Savannah and her family still aren't drinking city water. They've got cases of bottled water stacked up in the hall of their apartment. And yes, the city gives out a case of water a day. But that doesn't really cut it for Savannah, her two brothers, the cousins who stay there, and her single dad, Philip, who's currently unemployed. Well, basically, I might, with this water, I might spend about a $100 I don't have. He's even given his kids new rules about how to take a shower. Instead of using bar soap, I've got the uh, body wash. And I have, like, I tell them when they take a shower, put the body wash on you first, lather with body wash, without the water, and then, you know, pursue taking a bath. Spend as little time in the water as possible. Right, right, hurry up and get out of there. Like a lot of parents, Liddell is on the lookout for signs of lead damage in his kids. Well, you really can't see anything. Unless there is very severe lead poisoning. That's like Thompson, a professor at Wayne State University and an expert on lead. There is a very substantial direct correlation between lead poisoning and loss of IQ and lead poisoning and loss of the ability to control your impulsive reactions. What do you think? That doesn't hurt at all. So hundreds of parents were getting their children tested this week, bringing them to a, yes, this is the title, Family Fun Night and Lead Testing Event at one of the city's schools. There were balloon animals, toys, volunteers being as perky as possible, but squirming toddlers still had to get their fingers pricked repeatedly to draw enough blood to fill a little vial. I think, Beth, unfortunately, I'm going to have to poke you one more time, okay? Evelyn Woods brought her five-year-old Bethany for testing. She got a stuffed dog after her test. She seems like she's being pretty brave. Yeah. What did you tell her before you guys came here? Um, I just told her she had to go get poked and get tested for, you know, lead and make sure she was okay. The tests, which were paid for by the county health department, will come back in a week or two. But lead levels are only detectable for 30 to 40 days. So kids could have been poisoned months ago and it wouldn't show up now. The place where any long-term damage will show up is in school. Eileen Tomasi is the Flint School District nurse. The one nurse for the entire district, that's 5,500 students. Some of the psychologists in the district have said they're, they're the little kids, the three, four, and five-year-olds that they're testing, that they've already seen a difference. What are they seeing? Um, they're, not, they're not where they should be right now um, as far as like sociability skills that they test the little ones. This is going to be a, 
a, an ongoing issue for years and years and years. It's, it's a whole generation here that's been poisoned. Um, so the impact on the schools will be huge. Flint schools are deep in debt. This year, the school system hopes to have a budget deficit of only $10 million. That's down from a $21 million deficit last year. It's unclear how a system so strapped, even before the lead, can handle this. The Flint superintendent, Bilal Tawab, says the schools will need more special ed teachers, more nurses, and more early childhood programs. He says they hope to get more money from the state and describe the situation as an education emergency, one where the mistakes of adults are being paid for by kids. In Flint, I'm Lizzie O'Leary for Marketplace. Lizzie wrote up some thoughts about what she found while she was out reporting in Flint. She's posted them at medium.com. Our handle there is at Marketplace. Check them out. The head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Chen, said today that the Zika virus is, and this is a quote, spreading explosively. The disease spread by mosquitoes is of particular risk to pregnant women and their unborn children, which has prompted some countries to warn women against getting pregnant at all. It's also prompted some airlines to offer refunds in certain cases and businesses to reconsider their plans in the face of yet another fast-moving and so far incurable virus. Marketplace's Kimberly Adams has that story. Major airlines are already offering to change or refund tickets for pregnant women, but they may need to do more than that, says Lori Garrett. She's an infectious disease expert at the Council on Foreign Relations. The hardiest mosquito on the planet cannot fly across the ocean. They hitchhike inside the hulls of ships, sometimes airplanes. But you can at least be pretty confident this virus won't harm trade. Nobody in the world could survive much in a globalized economy if they tried to cut off everything from southern Canada to Tierra del Fuego as trade partners. And she says that's the range we're talking about for this virus. So trade might be okay, but travel agencies are watching closely. My sister is pregnant. She was scheduled to go to a couple of business trips and events to Colombia, and she had to cancel them. Carlos Ettery is with Forest Travel, which does a lot of work in Latin America. Things like destination weddings, business travel, and conferences. But I'll tell you that any woman that is pregnant that was supposed to travel to Latin America within the next couple of months is canceling. But he says most business travelers are fine, which matches up with what Vicky Fernandez de la Rea is seeing in Brazil. She's with Carlson Wagonlit Travel, which has a lot of multinational clients. Over time, this kind of alerts have maybe less impact in what customers think about or how they then react when they hear it. Because regular travelers hear things like this all the time. In Washington, I'm Kimberly Adams for Marketplace. Coming up. I spent a lot of money on clothes for the girls and... Actually, this year, that was a big help because I have extra money to spend on them, you know, for things for school and all that. A dollar you don't spend on oil is a dollar in your pocket. But first, let's do the numbers. The Dow Industrial is up 125 points today. Three quarters percent closed at 16,069. The Nasdaq rose 38 points, about eight tenths percent, 4506. The S&P 500 gained 10 points, about a half percent, ended things at 1893. Facebook, we told you about. Elsewhere in the social media world, LinkedIn delivered one and six tenths percent today. Twitter, however, continued with its woes off 1.7 percent. News today that the drugstore giant Walgreens won't send tests to a Theranos lab in California. A government report says the blood testing startup's lab jeopardized patient safety. Walgreens Boots Alliance shaved off one percent. CVS Health slumped nine-tenths of one percent today. Bond prices rose. The yield on the 10-year T-note fell to 1.98 percent. You're listening to Marketplace. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdal. General Motors unveiled its new electric car at the North American International Auto Show earlier this month. It's called the Chevy Bolt, not to be confused with GM's hybrid, the Chevy Volt. 
And the car is getting some buzz, nothing to sneeze at when gas prices are low, big cars are selling well, and American automobile production continues to rise. Pam Fletcher is the executive chief engineer for electrified vehicles at GM, or another way to think about it, she is arguably in charge of the future for the world's number three car company. Pam, it's good to have you on. Kai, great to be with you today. Tell me, I guess, first of all, how important this car is to General Motors. You know, the Bolt really is uh, an investment in the future. And so we look at this car to be uh, the breakthrough to take EVs mainstream. Um, We think EVs are important for a number of reasons. One is uh, to provide uh, alternative forms of transportation, but also a platform, you know, to layer on uh, technologies, uh, technologies throughout the car, including um, safety uh, features, mm-hmm. including connectivity, uh, leading to autonomous, and ultimately a great solution for ride sharing. You must be gratified then uh, in the extreme that this thing is being compared very favorably to uh, like Tesla's, which cost two and three times as much. Yeah, you know, it's really important for us to uh, break through with the first um, high range, yep. uh, affordable 200, 200 EV. miles, we should say, right? Yep, 200 plus miles <laughs> uh, affordably, under $30,000 net federal incentives. So does it kill you now when you see gas at $2 a gallon? You know, what we've learned is um, we have over 80,000 uh, Generation 1 Volt owners on the road today. And what we've learned uh, from many of them is that they really love electric driving, and and they don't want to use gasoline at any price. In fact, some of them say, how much is gas? So, um, you know, that's a great part of our contingent, a great part of our owner base. And, you know, again, we think that EVs are, um, we think that the bold EV is really um, a look toward the future. Um, What are you going to work on next? Now that you've got this thing done, what's next for you as (laughs) as chief engineer at at, uh, Electrified Vehicles for GM? Yeah. Kai, I'd love to talk about that, but oh, come um, on. yeah, so that's uh, <laughs> off limits, but I'd love to talk about the Bold EV right now. All right, fair enough. Last thing, and then I'll let you go. Uh, do you get to drive one of these things day in and day out since you designed it, or, or is, do you have to do something? Yeah, so we have um, a test fleet uh, right now that we're using for all of our development testing. Um, you know, we have well over 100 cars, oh. and so um, many of our engineering team members, you know, obviously in the cars uh, all day. Um, driving the cars around on their their daily route because they learn from that as well, sure. as well as the testing they do at our proving grounds and other facilities. And when uh, are regular people going to get to drive? Yeah, so we will be in production uh, before the end of this year. So it's uh, coming up fast. We've got a lot of work to do, but we're really excited to get the car out in uh, consumers' hands. Pam Fletcher, the uh, executive chief engineer for electrified vehicles at General Motors, talking about the Bolt. Pam, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Guy. Great to talk to you. The Obama administration has agreed to write off about $28 million worth of student loans for some former students of Corinthian colleges. Corinthian collapsed last spring amid charges by the Department of Education of widespread fraud and deception. Now, though, thousands more borrowers are hoping for some debt relief as well. From the Education Desk at WYPR in Baltimore, Maryland, Marketplace's Amy Scott has that story. In 2007, Pamela Hunt had just finished her bachelor's degree at the University of Connecticut when she saw an ad online for Everest University. You know, if you were a single mom, underemployed, this would be perfect. They had a great job placement. Hunt, who has five children, wanted to be a probation officer. Two years later, she had a master's in criminal justice from Everest's online program. But all those promises of job placement amounted to little more than a few emailed links to job search websites. Everest's parent company, Corinthian Colleges, was later fined $30 million for inflating its job placement figures and eventually forced out of business. Needless to say, I was never, I've was i never been employed in my field of study. Now Hunt is making less than $15 an hour as a home health aide. Between her two degrees, she has $159,000 in student loan debt. Last May, she applied to have her Everest loans forgiven through a little-known part of federal law. If the college lied about anything that relates to the loans or the education, potentially the, the loans could be canceled. It's incredibly vague. 
That's financial aid expert Mark Kantrowitz with CapEx.com. According to advocacy group The Debt Collective, former students from other for-profit colleges like ITT Tech and the Art Institutes have also filed claims. Robin Smith with the National Consumer Law Center says it will take months for education officials to set rules to determine who qualifies. Which is why we are calling on the department to immediately stop collecting on student loans when students assert a defense to repayment claim regardless of the school that they went to. More than 7,500 students have applied for debt relief in the last six months. If that sounds like a lot, Smith says hundreds of thousands should be eligible. I'm Amy Scott for Marketplace. There are plus or minus 6 million homes in the northeast part of the United States that use oil for heat. It's been a not-so-bad winter so far, so those homeowners are already saving over what they spent last year. You throw in falling crude prices, and it's a pretty good deal. What might also be happening, though, is a drop in the demand for conversion to other, that is, cleaner fuels. From WNPR in Hartford, Connecticut, Harriet Jones has that one. Andy Kane pulls up to deliver heating oil to a house in Waterford, Connecticut. Once in a while on these cold days, the condensation left in the fill pipe will have the cap stick. As he gets the oil flowing, homeowner Teresa Carter comes out to say hello. Don't go too far, Teresa, you might be interviewed. Actually, Carter's pretty happy to talk about the falling price of heating oil. She says her family's paying about half what they did last year to heat their home, even with a new addition. That break in the price means she and her husband have quit fighting over the thermostat. So I always nudge it up when he nudges it down. But this year, you know, being that we heated a little bit more, I nudge it up a little bit more, and he lets me. <laughs> Our customers have saved a ton of money without having to sacrifice anything. Mark Mazzella runs Benvenuti Oil, the company that delivers to Teresa Carter's home. Like the vast majority of Connecticut's 500 oil companies, it's a small, family-owned concern. Mazzella says despite the comparatively mild winter in the Northeast, his customers are actually using more oil than they would usually do in similar weather just because they can afford to feel more comfortable. He says on average, homeowners use about 875 gallons in a winter, and they'll still save more than $1,000 over last year. I know we've been reading a lot about and hearing a lot about energy prices falling and it's taking down the Dow and a huge loss for this and that, but the bottom line is it's putting more money in people's pockets. Mazzella is also pleased his customers may feel less inclined to switch fuel sources. In 2012, citing high oil prices, Governor Daniel Malloy encouraged billions of dollars in investment to build out natural gas lines in the state. He aimed to bring the fuel to 280,000 new customers. But the gas utility companies confirm they're now failing to meet their targets for converting households away from cheaper heating oil. Professor Eric Chen says that's a downside of the drop in oil prices. I think the conversion is actually a, a decent idea, and we should be, as a society, we should be exploring those kinds of, uh, of alternatives to see which one comes out best. And Chen, who teaches business at the University of St. Joseph in Hartford, says while low oil prices are a temporary boon to the Northeast, so far there's little evidence that consumers are rushing out to spend the windfall. Yes, the consumers are finding a little extra in their pocket, but no, the consumers aren't really doing anything so much about it. They still have long memories and they're still a little bit conservative and they have a wait-and-see approach to this. But certainly some in the state can't afford to wait and see. Pamela Nazario is a single parent to two girls. She drives a school bus for a living, and heating her rented house with oil has been a serious hardship in the past. Last year, only for 100 gallons, I think it was four seventy-five, dollars dollars $175. Only for 100 gallons, which only lasts me like two, three weeks the most. This year, a big chunk of that money can go elsewhere. I spent a lot of money on clothes for the girls, and actually this year that was a big help because I have extra money to spend on them, you know, for, for things for school and all that. And if recent cold weather persists, she hopes the 10-year low in heating oil prices will also continue. In Hartford, I'm Harriet Jones for Marketplace.
This final note on the way out, a quick follow to our story yesterday about ad rates in tonight's Trumpless Republican primary debate. Mr. Trump has been tweeting all last night and all day today about how the rates Fox is getting for tonight's events are, and this is a quote, dropping like a rock. Turns out that's not true. Lie would be another word. The Wall Street Journal and CNN are both reporting Fox's rates are holding steady at about $200,000 for 30 seconds of airtime. That is a premium for what debates usually get. All right, that's all we got. The Dow up 125 points today, about three quarters percent. The Nasdaq up 38 points, eight tenths percent. The S&P 500 put on 10 points. That's about a half percent there. John Buckley, Deirdre Depke, Eve Epstein, Nancy Fargali, George Judson, Dave Shaw, and Betsy Streisand are the Marketplace editing staff. Our managing editor is Mark Miller. I'm Kai Rizdal, and we will see you tomorrow. This is APM.